Lockheed Martin calls the Mako the missile of 13 with utter disregard of superstition. In fact, it is 3.96 meters long, 0.33 meters in diameter, its mass at launch is 590 kilos, and the warhead is 60 kilos. This is supposed to be a joke, sir? Yes, Otis, I think it's quite funny. Dear human viewers from the United States, here is the joke explanation. So it all started with the CAW project in May 2022. It is the stand-in attack weapon. The CAW is the missing link of fifth generation warfare. A large part of the entire concept of having aircraft capable of surviving in contested airspace is to use short range rather than long range weapons for air to ground attack. Short range has several benefits, at generally lower cost, it is cheaper to achieve higher accuracy, typically with laser designation, and the BDA can be immediate. As everybody knows, with the current US line, the F-35 is the fifth generation aircraft that would be operating in contested airspace. Therefore, the weapons must fit inside the F-35 base to preserve stealth. Which is obviously not enough, the weapons must also be integrated with the F-35, which often is not that simple. See Meteor, for example. In June 2022, the US Air Force assigned a contract for the initial CAW development to three participants, Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop Grumman and Altry Harris. The competition was won by Northrop Grumman in 2023, but Lockheed Martin was not ready to throw the towel on their own investment. And in fact, they went in another direction. Or better, they went there at a different speed. At hypersonic speed, to be precise. The Mako is not the only hypersonic or generically very high speed weapon in development in the United States. For example, it is worth mentioning the hypersonic air launch anti-surface project managed by the US Navy to expand its anti-surface capabilities since the LRASM is not considered to be lethal enough. And again, the US Navy is assessing the possibility to field a small anti-ship missile capable of fitting inside the F-35 base as well. There are a few other programs for weapons of different classes, but this is a subject for another time. The Mako, as we said, was originally developed for a US program, but its history goes back to 2017 as a private venture. It just turned out to be a good option for the CAW and this allowed for a full-scale design. Now that Lockheed Martin is out of the US competition, they are looking for a launch customer that could finance the full-scale development and testing because the Mako did not fly yet and it wasn't tested at all. At the moment, the Persian Gulf states, and Qatar in particular, seem interested. Why this weapon is important? Well, not really because of the performance or the capabilities, but because of the design and the concept behind it. It is a sort of a first in its field. This is not exactly the first, sir. You are old enough to remember the Sherman tank, for example. Otis, how old do you think I am? Your medical records say you are 56. Sir. Otis, how do you have access to my medical records? You asked me to reorder your medications. Do you remember, sir? Uh, no, but this is not the end of it, okay? What was I saying? Ah, yes. In terms of general configuration, the missile is not just round and conical. It has a spine where the suspension hooks are located and two small cheeks on the lower frontal tapered section. The tail section is tapered as well, and it features four surfaces in an X configuration. The function of the spine is most likely to contain the cables connecting the guidance section to the tail section, which hosts the, the actuators for the tail surfaces. It is more difficult to determine the function of the cheeks. They could have the same function of the spine housing connections, or they could have an aerodynamic function, or they could be antenna housings. Obey this is less likely given the form factor. There is actually nothing on the outside suggesting the function, and they're really quite curious. 
The picture we have seen suggests that the propulsion section is about two-thirds of the length of the missile, maybe a tad shorter. The warhead, being about 60 kilos, is on the light side, so whatever the guidance may be, it needs to be very accurate to be effective. Lockheed Martin did not disclose the projected range and the flight profile. Uh, the propulsion is a single solid fuel rocket, which means that the missile will accelerate while the rocket is burning and then it will coast to the target. And this means that the MACO is actually a small form factor aeroballistic missile. Compared with other solutions, it's almost adorable. The flight profile depends on the launch vector. In fact, the missile, according to Lockheed Martin, could be either air-launched, sea-launched or ground-launched to engage ground targets or surface targets. Most likely, the MACO will accelerate to reach high altitude and dive into the target. During the high altitude flight, it will reach the top speed of Mach 5 and above, but it will slow down when diving onto the target. This is the same flight profile, or at least the same concept, of the Russian Kinjal, which is very fast, but not necessarily hypersonic, in the terminal stage of the trajectory. I actually made some back-of-the-envelope calculations based on the fact that the main shockwave should not interfere with the spine, and the result is that the top speed of the weapon should be Mach 6.8. This is based on the available pictures, uh, and it's difficult to measure angles on the screen, uh, so take this with a pinch of salt. The MACO is designed from the outset to be cheap to produce, with a reasonable level of modularity that also allows for multi-function. Modular warheads for different targets, and modular guidance sections uh, for different purposes. First of all, the MACO is entirely designed with digital engineering techniques, which is the reason why a prototype could be ready in such a short time. Furthermore, the MACO is an original design, but it is a sample making large use of off-the-shelf components. The propulsion module, the actuators, and the guidance section are off the shelf as well. Lockheed Martin did not release any more details on these components, but they explicitly stated that they are already in use and available on the market. And this is probably the reason why you see the spine. They did not want to change the propulsion section if it is acquired off the shelf. Another important element is the use of additive manufacturing, that is, 3D printing. The tail fins and the guidance sections are 3D printed, and this is noteworthy for various reasons. One of the problems of hypersonic weapons is obviously the heat generated by the hypersonic flights, which can easily reach hundreds or even thousands of degrees, uh, depending on the speed and the atmospheric density. The fins are one of the most heated components since they produce secondary shocks. For high-speed hypersonic weapons, they have always been a problem since they tended to basically melt away. The MACO is aerodynamically stabilized and steered, which means that they trust their manufacturing process to produce fins resistant enough to last for the entire flight time. Lockheed Martin published some pictures of the guidance section fairing, another part which is produced with additive manufacturing. This is another section that is subject to heavy thermal stresses. The thickness of the metal seems quite substantial, about a centimeter, showing that thermals are a consideration. It also seems that the nose section is screwed on, and it will probably be even more substantial since this is the most stressed section in hypersonic flight. The guidance section also features some optical windows, or so they seem, which point sideways or, I would guess, downwards when in flight. The guidance, the autopilot, and the internal electronics are designed with an open architecture, which should allow to quickly produce different variants with different guidance systems. And in fact, the missile is designed to be multi-role, either air-to-ground for fixed targets, or anti-ships, or even anti-radiation. This probably means leaving some performance on the ground in every specific role, but having a very adaptable weapon that could be mass-produced is an important element of large-scale operations management. Why is this weapon, which is not even officially in service, important? Well, it is somehow an unusual concept for the American way, which favors large programs featuring cutting-edge technology. Technological progress in this case seems to have been limited on purpose, leveraging what is available at the moment. 
I mean, hypersonic or in general high speed has been considered the key feature and everything else was built from off-the-shelf components. Considering that the Americans usually prefer furtivity and stealth, uh, this is an important, important deviation from the norm. And I would also add that this is probably the realization that technological progress doesn't translate automatically into increased effectiveness. And in my view, this is a positive development for the United States military industrial complex. That's what I believe. We will see if it happens again. So, thank you very much for watching this short video. It's a honor and a privilege having had your attention. I must say an outsized thank you to all those who are supporting the channel by being a member or being on Patreon or by any other of the means available. And by the way, there is also a GoFundMe which is actually connected with a book that I am trying to write. It's a long-term project, but if you're interested, the QR code is on the screen and there's a link in the comments below. If you can support the channel, it's perfectly, perfectly fine, but then please interact. Subscribe if you haven't yet, hit like, hit the bell, and so on. So this is the end. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.